you for that, Lauren. As mentioned, this is CSI ARU. Are any of you on Twitter? I did post some images. Oh, I've frozen. There you go. I did post some images the other day when we were doing some of our face to face crime scene practicals. So at ARU, it is one of the most long standing universities in the UK running a forensic science programme. I applied for it oh, back in 1998, but I ended up going to Teesside University, um, which is also um, a really good stand in for crime and forensic science. So a few years ago, ARU expanded into the crime and investigative studies um, field. So those of you that are perhaps thinking you want the degree to become a police officer or to help you with any police roles, prison roles, perhaps any public service, or you perhaps want to bolster criminology more of your thinking degree to the how do we apply this into practice? Our forensic science courses are more scientific if you wish to end up going into lab work. So we'll just do a quick um, what do we know about forensic science? Because everybody thinks it's really, really interesting and everybody thinks it's all about gory stuff outside. Whereas in actuality, there's quite a bit of theory behind it as well. So hopefully now you can see the screen. I've got up and I've now lost my team's chat. There you go. So you should all be able to see the pin that we've got here. I know some of you have been joining already, so we'll give it a couple of minutes for you all to join in. I was told there was likely to be a fair few of you. Um, so students, you can all get your phones out now. Hopefully you're watching this all on a big screen or on a laptop, which is kind of what we suggest when we've been running our online lessons. We suggest that students access Teams to a laptop and then we can use a phone for any other learning activities that we've got here. I can see Brian's class. Wave at the class. Thank you, Brian. So I don't know if the students want to wave at the camera rather than looking at the, sc the big screen for a second. I can see one student second row in on the back with hair, another one with a hat. Thank you. So all you guys, if you can get your um, get your cahoots going, so go to kahoot.it on a web page or on an app. It's probably easier on a web browser, so you don't have to faff about trying to download the app. Um, again, if you have got your laptops open, then that would be brilliant. I've only got five questions, so it's a quick, just a very, very quick knowledge check for yourselves. What school are you from, Brian? It's the international, you're muted. Oh, there you go, Suffolk one. You're from Suffolk? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for that. So obviously we are recording this session, so we can just about see your students there, which are on camera with us in the background. But yeah, I can see we've now got 13 students. So I don't know if Suffolk ones are all joining in. As if you say, it's easier just to use the browser and try to download the app unless you've already got it. And there we go, L-E-G-K. Teachers, you can join in as well. Callie. L plus ratio. That's a groovy, groovy birth certificate name. B, oh, our B's a cat. Our students do quite like the cahoots, and we tend to use them within our tutorial sessions, A, eh? because it um, the students can test their knowledge, it links into the lecture notes that we've discussed, and also it's very, very good for exam results. So we'll let a few more at 10.08. So I know that some of you were doing criminology, you were saying in Rose's classroom, Cornelia, AM. So I'm from a crime scene background, so I've got 15 years experience of working as both a crime scene officer in various forces throughout the country and then also as a digital investigation officer. So those of you that have all got mobile phones, it used to be my job to download all of the data for mobile phones and other mobile digital devices such as your Xbox, your SD cards and your tablets as well. So do be aware that we can extract the majority of data even if it's been deleted or you think you have an encryption whether it be Apple or Samsung Knox on your device as well. So I have covered a fair background, whether it be from, say, cars or rape victims, all the way up to all the nasties you might find, something like this. Right, we're at 10.09, now. I can see we've got 24. So as we do only have an hour, let's just go through these five questions and then see what we've got. So this is a very, very short introduction to forensic science and because I'm operational, um, 
some of the roles that I would do. So who stated every contact leaves a trace? Burke on the red, Locard on the blue, Watson on the yellow or Socrates on the green. And extra bonus points if somebody can write in the chat who these people are. And why do we think they might be relevant to forensic science? Well done. It was low card. Low card stated every contact leaves a trace. Does anybody from Suffolk One know who Watson was? Uh, this is where Brian goes. They do. They're just too scared. Go on, go on. Who is it? Lock card. What? <laughs> no, who's Watson? <laughs> no, I'm afraid I don't think we know. <laughs> That's okay, absolutely fine. Sherlock Holmes' partner. Um, yeah, he is Sherlock Holmes' partner, but in this particular thing, they were part of the DNA. So remember back in the 50s, we had the DNA strands. Um, Watson yeah. was one of that group of people. Burke, Burke was one of the anatomists. Burke and Hare from the Edinburgh region. They used to steal bodies. Um, obviously, anatomy um, and pathology is a really, really, really big part of operational forensic science. And Socrates was a thinker from back in those Greco-Roman days. Socrates is also the name of the database that we use within um, the policing and forensic science world to import all our evidence and information. OK, but well done, those of you that were aware of Locard. Every contact leaves a trace. Think about that primary and secondary transfer, OK? Any of you that might have dogs, cats, pets, or when you've eaten, you end up with lots of debris, don't you, that we move from the item to ourselves and ourselves to a secondary item. So next question. Oh, well done, Cornelia, on that one. So it is fastest finger on Kahoot. So what is the job description of this person? So is it a crime scene investigator, a crime scene examiner, a scene of crime officer or all of the above? A bit of a trick question and those of you that are due to take examinations, you might find reading a question and the answers given would help you. So the answer is all of the above. So if you see in all of the above and you think, oh, it could be one or two, the answer's possibly all of them. So yes, I used to be that person. So depending on the force that you work in, you could be a scenes of crime officer, you could be a crime scene examiner, or you could be a crime scene investigator. You could also be a forensic examiner or a forensic investigator as well. So yeah, a bit of an exam hint for you there. If you see all of the above and you think, I know it's definitely not one. So yes, a scenes of crime officer. But of course, that person was wearing full protective clothing. So anybody that's dealing with a crime scene, whether you're a forensic scientist or you're a DC coming to visit a scene, you will be expected to wear PPE. So although we've recently, recently had the mask mandate, haven't we? As a scenes of crime officer, I'd have been wearing a mask all day most of the time anyway, because a lot of the powders that we deal with for fingerprints can be quite hazardous and also we don't want to contaminate um, any any exhibits or also damage ourselves okay oh well done Josh knocking Cornelia off there particularly fastest finger first on that one Josh well done which exhibit type is the best source of DNA so is it soil fibers on the blue fingerprints on the yellow or blood on the green which is the best source of DNA. 22 answers. So yes, blood is our best source of DNA. So we can get DNA sometimes from the fingerprint sweat, but then you have to determine are we powdering to lift that fingerprint and then possibly contaminating the sweat that's left on a surface or not, but the question here was best. Is anybody, any of you with a scientific mind, what is specific about blood? Am I likely to always get DNA from blood? Is anybody able to put that in the chat? Or wants to speak? So you've all gone through your GCSE sciences by now. You're all aware of cell composition. You should all be aware of where, where, where. Yes, exactly. Well done, Josh. Red blood cells have no nucleus, so they don't have any DNA in them. So when we look for blood, we want to look for white blood cells. So as we're aware, blood is a fluid. It's made up of big, fat, heavy iron, heme, oxygen holding red blood cells and white blood cells 
which as well, which sit within the plasma and the white blood cells that we know, they're good, aren't they? They help us with our immune system and everything like that. So it's the white blood cells that have got the nucleus. OK, and it's within that nucleus that we have our DNA, our building blocks of life. So when we're swabbing for our blood, because red blood cells are heavy, they tend to sit in the middle of our blood stain. What we want to do is look for the white blood cells on the outside. So it is possible to not actually not get any DNA from blood because you sometimes find different people don't have that many white blood cells. So, yes, we can also get DNA from soil. We can also get DNA from fibres. And there was a zoological experiment over the last weekend where they were hoovering DNA out of the air as well, which is why contamination and integrity at a scene is really, really important. We've all learned about airborne contamination lately. Exactly the same thing. But yes, if we found any of those at a scene, we'd be really happy with blood. Well done, B. Thank you for that. So true or false? Is entomology a field of forensic science? True on the blue, false on the red. And then if anybody can tell me what entomology is. True, entomology, it is a field of forensic science. Forensic science is basically anything that we can represent within a court of law. So that's what forensic means. So sometimes people will have or I don't know, forensic makeup or look at something within forensic detail. That term forensic is to apply within a court of law, but also be analytical and detailed as well. So, yes, that term entomology. Is anybody able to explain to the rest of the group um, what entomology is? I can see we've got some chat going on at the back of Brian Wharton's classrooms. So perhaps those students know. Entomology, what do we think? Just take a wild guess. Bear in mind, you do have computers with answers on in front of you as well. Um, who, who, Aaron, oh, Aaron, Aaron, insects. Insects, it is entomology, is the study of insects. Maisie's also written bugs in there, where, in there as well. And ARU, our biological sciences department, is mainly bugs and animals. OK, and one of our members of staff actually found a new bug in Africa recently. So, yes, entomology, all to do with bugs. Very, very important. I'm sure you've heard of like when people die or the flies get in our bodies. It's working through those lifestyles, those life cycles there. So well done, Ellie. I think we've got our last question now. Does anybody have the same fingerprint pattern? True on the blue, false on the red. Does anybody have the same fingerprint pattern? Exactly. We don't have the same fingerprint patterns at all. Um, I think that the it was something like one in 60 billion. Um, and I think there's about 70 billion of us on the planet, so we might find somebody else. But are they likely to be in the same place as you commit in the same crime in the same house? Very, very unlikely as well. And you'll tend to find not only is it the pattern. If you will look at your fingerprints, you can all see that you've got different details and patterns, those ridges and those troughs within those ridges and troughs. We've also got age tears within our skins or scars or pores and that's what even if we found those two people from that 60 million together their hands would have done different things so you would have ended up with different damage detail to those hands as well so a trained fingerprint expert would be able to negate um, those patterns and tell you that they were different so i've got identical twin nieces so their dna is the same because they came from the same egg think back to your re re um, reproductive studies gcses that you would have done I, I think we used to do that in year nine. And although they've got the, the same or very, very similar DNA, their fingerprints would be very, very different. OK, so shall we see who's top of the pops? So in third place is Cornelia. Well done. GK. And then who is first? It's SM Ellie running up there from behind. Well done everybody and then we have am and tyler in there so let me just bring my powerpoint slides back up because as we're all aware teams does not like going back to powerpoint so i've got to browse again so was there anything in there which you thought um was quite new information for yourselves that blood is a good source of DNA. Yes, exactly. So any skin, any cell within our body, whether it be um, like cells within our saliva 
or the hair follicle. Hair itself doesn't have DNA, but the follicle does. Um, skin cells, various bits of different fluids, depending on where they come from within the system. But yes, well done everybody on that. So here is Mr. Edmond Locard, one of the founding fathers of forensic science. OK, and anybody that's ever been at a crime scene or intends to go there, we should know that every contact leaves a trace. And this is particularly important for those of you that wish to work within laboratories as well. We need to make sure that yourselves and your, your laboratories are extremely clean and sterile, because if, say, if you were working on a case where we've had suspect glass in and you've been examining that and then you don't clean your bench properly and we have some victim or control glass, it could easily get mixed up and that's how we have contamination. Those of you that want to know more about contamination or perhaps dealing with criminology, you may want to look at the um, Amanda Knox, Meredith Kirscher murder that we had oh, a few years ago down in Italy, where basically um, exhibits were stored in the same place and there was very, very little cleanliness between them as well. And whether things had been done wrongly or not, it was really easy, easy, easy for the defence to put that um, theory of doubt okay so we always work to prove an until um or guilt uh, innocent until proven guilty okay within the uk so we make sure that everything that we do has to be correct and clean especially with in forensic science so we did discuss fingerprints so here what is a fingerprint and there is some information on this slide about how do you get your own fingerprints. So for those of you that aren't quite aware, I'm putting a link in the chat now that your own tutors and teachers can discuss with you later if needed. But yes, obviously we're all aware now that people come out of the womb and they float around in liquid. As we float around in liquid, that skin forms, okay? It folds into all these little, as it says, that basal layer and folds within those skins. And that's how we get fingerprints, okay? And also if you were to then look at your feet as well, so yeah we can then get lift foot, footprints as well and match those ear prints nose prints too so as well as fingerprints just quickly now in the chat or you can call out and speak what type of exhibits do you think we can recover from a crime scene we have discussed some already within that cahoot Clothing, clothing, clothing. Yes, we can get clothing from a crime scene. What type of sub exhibits could we then get from that clothing? Fibres. Fibres, excellent. And Lara in the chat has said hair. Yes, so there are some items that we would see as whole. If you say like clothing, it will have picked up my skin cells for my DNA, it would have hair, it will have bits of my dog on it, probably bits of food. So you end up with lots of different items that we can get from one exhibit. So we, we, we need to be really, really careful with how we package, present, and then move those exhibits to our forensic analysts. Okay, so yeah. So when we have exhibits, they're split into they're split into different types. So we've discussed DNA and you can see that here and that's classed as a biological exhibit. So all of these different types of liquids and samples that we can get from bodies. OK, also we've got blood, we've got semen, we've got vaginal fluid. They actually both glow differently underneath UV light. So if you are examining um, a sexual offences scene, sputum, nasal mucus, we can get DNA from those. So when people spit, like you tend to get on, say, revenge or criminal attacks on vehicles and properties. And um, again, if you get arrested and go to custody, we will take samples and swabs from various parts of your body. We'll take nail clippings. Does anybody able to tell me why they think nail clippings or nail swabbings would be would be taken from somebody in custody? Why would we want nail clippings? Go on, trauma, Brian. Trauma, right? Right. So yes, exactly. We might have something underneath. So there's been lots of stuff in the news lately about how we all protect ourselves and just common sense awareness, really. But if somebody was attacking you and you had three hands, if you were to scratch, you'd get their skin cells and we would swab that. So we would take nail clippings and nail samples, swabbings from victims as well as our custody um, residents as well. Pathological samples. Does anybody know what pathological samples are? I can see Rosie is typing for her students. Victims DNA, exactly. We'd always take victims, um, householders, elimination DNA, as well as our offenders. We've got something to compare and match to. Any of the students know what pathological means? Do you want to shout at me, Brian? No, I'm afraid no, no one knows. No one knows. Nobody knows. So pathological, it's a post-mortem. 
So if somebody dies in unusual circumstances, we need to find out why. So we will take our people very carefully to a hospital and we'll have a special trained doctor, a pathologist who has done through a home office course, knows how to deal with evidence. And we will take various samples. So, for instance, stomach contents. OK, what did that person last eat? Do we then need any um, say liver or heart samples? Did that person actually not die from being stabbed but have um, liver cirrhosis? So we'll take lots of different pathological samples and as a CSI or forensic analyst analyse it, you would sometimes have to store those, transport them and deal with them. And of course, DNA from trace evidence as well as elimination DNA, as Rosie has stated there. Trace, we touched on trace evidence in the Kahoot. So trace is everything that's kind of little that can move across that primary and secondary transfer belt. So paint off a door, say if somebody's forced a door or a window to get into a property. Glass, when glass breaks, it goes three to four metres in either direction. So it's quite handy to take a sample from the frame so it's not contaminated. But if we have somebody that has got glass in their hair when we get into custody, it's quite likely that they were present when that glass smashed and it fell on their hair rather than them just walking into it. Because we probably have a variety of glass in our shoes as we just walk down a public access area. So we do need to think about the location of items when we seize them or recover them or send them for analysis and where they would be in our scene, on our victim or also on any of our offenders. And the same for trace goes for soil or fibre or wood. Anything that we kind of need to do later analysis on, OK? All of those things that we look at through microscopes and can physically fit. Liftable would be your fingerprints, your footwear, your earmarks. Anything that, as you can see from the picture at the bottom left of the slide, where we could use a powder and then lift and then send for match analysis. And then we have our chemical exhibits. So those items that might be drugs, those samples that we need to test then. Again, glass, we can treat that with chemical reactions as well as looking at a microscopy. Hairs and fibres, we want to know exactly what's this fibre made from. Pens, inks, anything that might have a contaminant on it. Arson fuels as well. So we've got lots of different type of exhibits. They can all get analysed in different ways that so they all need to be prepared and collected correctly. Because it is 2020, we now do have digital exhibits. So I mentioned that I used to work within the digital field and all of those different things there, all of those different devices we can get um, data from. And we're more likely to get a conviction using digital data than we are the old traditional wet forensic method. So wet forensic is generally everything we would send to a lab. OK, you're not likely to find fingerprints at a crime scene anymore because people know to wear gloves. We can match the gloves and I do lift gloves and we do match gloves and we match footwear. But if you've got your mobile phone on and you've got your GPS or it's pinging, we can track this. OK, and we do very often catch people mainly on digital. I worked on a murder um, a couple of years ago, closer to where I live, and there was a tracker involved on a vehicle there were mobile phones and we were able to trace the offenders and the victim as well um, because they were disputing that they'd even been in the area but because they weren't very technically aware their phone ping them in okay spy cameras cctv so somebody was mentioning clothing as an exhibit although we can get further exhibits from that main item we can all use it also use it as an identifiable um, source of information as well of course, at a crime scene, we need to photograph everything before we recover it. So first attending officers, they will have um, body worn video cameras. I'm sure you've seen them now and all the police programmes that are about. And that will video a the state of the victim, the initial state of the property, what the offender's doing if we do have one. And then as a crime scene officer, we need to make sure we photograph the um, entirety of the scene, including all of the exhibits, because those photos are used to send to, send to the court or the forensic analysts or anybody else that might be involved within that case because they can't all go to the crime scene. OK, we also need to make sure that we photograph anything with detail. So it's a fingerprint or a tool mark or a footwear mark. We need to make sure that they're photographed to a correct flat level so that they can be blown up on a screen and our um, and our fingerprint experts can view them almost like in a one to one. OK. So once we've determined what's happened at the scene, who do we need to send to the scene? What are we recovering? We need to make sure that to get those items to our important forensic scientists, 
we need to package it correctly. There is no point putting a cup like this with liquid in it into a bag because the liquid will just splosh out everywhere. We won't get fingerprints from it. The DNA might merge and we might lose the content of what's in here. So we would probably have to decant this liquid out. Imagine perhaps if it's a pot with petrol or something in it, possibly swab the area because we can do that fingerprint powder it and then package it correctly so that it can then be used perhaps for an interview purpose. OK, yes, I have a skeleton on here because I do quite like anatomy. Those of you that are interested in working within forensic science and CSI policing, it is quite good for you to have a wide range of scientific ability, especially if you do then go into the direct operational forensic field. Very often you might be the only person working in that police station and the officers do expect you to know a bit of everything. And you can't keep calling the lab or your manager for advice, OK? So yes, I quite like all my anatomy. So we make sure we have different packaging. So as well as having a wide range of knowledge of what do I collect, it's how to collect it and how does it get analysed at the other end, OK? Because you might be somewhere at two in the morning and there's nobody to ask. So we need to make sure that we package our items correctly. Has anybody seen any of these before? Have you seen these? If you've watched TV, you probably will have done. So yes, so these are different types of evidence bags. So if you've watched police programmes, you will see that they've got their printed versions of these bags. Um, we've got boxes, we've got folders, we've got pots, we've got um, specialist nylon bags that don't drop um, plastic into um, any of our fire samples that we might need to look for accelerants. So we need to make sure that we don't um, damage or transfer anything from these bags or pots onto our exhibits, especially if we want to do some chemical analysis later. So once we've packaged everything, we then need to determine what our forensic analysis is. So has anybody ever heard of any of these? Those of you that have perhaps done your GCSE sciences. So are we aware of microscopes? Have we all used a microscope within our school? Yes, exactly. So we may have used single eye microscopes or double microscopes. So depending on how those microscopes are connected to different computer machines, such as at the bottom, we can get a slightly different analysis going on. So GRIM here at the top left of the slide stands for Glass Refractive Index Matrix. OK, so all glass is made slightly differently. You'll tend to find I live in quite a new house. I would imagine all of the glass that's been put in this property is through like this little cul de sac, they're probably all the same. So if we were to get a sample of this glass, it probably wouldn't be that conclusive if there was another window broken up on the street. What you might find differently though is all the grime on the outside, the cleaning products that we use, and also to then perhaps compare this glass to a car glass, that would be different, or to a thousand year old church window. OK, because they're all made slightly differently. So then to check this glass reflect, ref refractive index, we would get our piece of control glass that we've taken from our scene, we get a piece of say suspect glass that may have come from a victim's clothing and they would be placed into an oil substance and that oil is heated. Then when that oil becomes as transparent as the glass, that's how our scientists know that refractive index. We then repeat that with our second piece and if they come up with the same temperature for that oil, we know that those two pieces of glasses are likely to be the same. OK, so that's something that we can collect glass for and send to our scientists. They also do um, GCMS, which is a gas chromatography mass spectrometry as well, and lots of other things. And we do have all of these items with us at the labs in ARU. For DNA, we um, the best examination is PCR. Now, PCR has been banded around quite a lot over the last couple of years. Does anybody know what PCR is? Polymerase chain reaction. Exactly. Well done, Josh. Yes, it is that reaction of where we want to make more DNA strands. So say if I've only got a tiny little bit of blood, there might not be enough DNA within those white cells of that blood for us to put into the system. So we need to amplify it. So then to amplify DNA, there's a natural system within those cells that split it, match, split it, match, split it, match. And we need to replicate that within our machines, OK? And then something called polymerase, actually from a TAC microbe. Um, it's an enzyme that we use. It actually came from a heat loving bacterium that they found. So we split the DNA and then we replicate it and we heat it and we thaw it. And that's how we get enough DNA to then examine, OK?
Then for fingerprints, so we can see fingerprints with our eyes, can't we? If you stick, touch something really sticky, you're going to leave a fingerprint. I'm sure you've all heard of powders as well. We've just seen a picture of it in one of the previous slides. Those powders would adhere to um, the ac aqueous solution within your fingerprint, so generally your sweat molecules. Um, so we can use powders, we can use different light sources as well. So all those different colours, they can react to different parts of chemicals within that sweat. So for instance, urea, OK, so our sweat is pushing all those toxins out. Yes, yeah, so those light sources can help find those. And also we can then send items in for a treatment. So if we've got a piece of paper here and we've got fingerprints on it, I can't lift it with powder. But what I can do is lift it with a chemical treatment, which soaks into the paper and then it adheres to those chemicals. OK, so it's that chemical pattern, that chemicals that's been left within the sweat that we could that creates the pattern. OK, so we've got lots of different analysis we can do on all of those exhibits that we found. So here at Anglia Western University, so we're based in Cambridge. We do also have campuses in Chelmsford and Peterborough, but our forensic sciences department is based in the life in the School of Life Sciences in the big science building, brand new shiny building in the centre of the Cambridge campus. So I'm deputy course leader and I mainly teach on all of the um, all of those courses there, but because I've got a crime scene background, I'm deputy course leader for the crime and investigative studies um, degree course that we've got there. Forensic science, you start off studying the same modules, but then you move into chemistry and DNA. And our MSc um, is obviously a postgraduate course. We do have research there as well. So anything that we've covered today, we can do further research in too. So as we've got a few minutes, start thinking about questions you might want to ask. So these are the type of modules that we would cover on our crime course. As you can see, it's not just science. We do have pathology. We do have anthropology, which is bones. And we do have digital forensics as well. We do talk about mass fatalities because obviously if you have one deceased person, it's very sad. If you say have a plane crash and you have lots of deceased people, it's extra sad, but we need to make sure that the right bits of the people get back because when people tend to die in mass fatalities, a bit like you say a plane, they don't just, they tend to split up. There's lots of paperwork and processes. Fire, we cover fire, we cover the thinking as well of investigation. So those of you doing criminology, you might be interested in things like evidence based police and you've probably covered some of that already. Within our forensic science course, you can see here there's a far more scientific approach once we get to our second year. We do analytical chemistry, that spectroscopy as well, using those equipment that I mentioned, genetics and chemical criminalistics is actually a chemist is more following up with the trace evidence as well. There's deeper chemistry within the fire and explosion as well because if any of you are aware of, ex of, of how explosions work you can see that it's actually a chemistry reaction um, rather than just a, everything set on fire okay analysis of drugs and poisons toxicology as well and we all do a, a major project as well so we discuss some of the equipment that we have that we use with forensic science we also have a human bone collection some of which is actual bone we then have copies that we can use we have animal bones on site because ARU has a really good zoology course too those of you that are thinking of that um, we do chemical fingerprint enhancement we also have a really fancy 360 camera that's something I've never used outside in the field we used to take pictures and stitch them together this machine basically does it all for you okay we have tents outside we actually worked outside the other day in our tents first time for ages managed to get everybody on campus to do crime scenes so we will expect students to work both inside and outside to replicate real life because not every crime scene is in a nice tidy warm room OK, everything is obviously risk assessed. We do follow ISO accreditation. So those of you that are dealing with any scientific work should be aware of your ISO accreditations. 17020 and 17025. One is for inspection and one is for analysis. OK, and obviously we always follow our standard operating procedures, which is exactly the same as, say, your experimentations you would follow out of your textbooks or if you were following instructions from your teacher. OK. So that's basically my introduction to forensic science. We've discussed a little bit of what happens in the labs, but we've discussed what we need to do outside. So I got asked to have a question and answer session. So I think we've got about 15 minutes left before you have to go and move on to the next um, 
your next presentation. So does anybody have any questions? <laughs>